Okay, my name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM, and here we are for another Expert Insight interview, and I'm delighted to be joined by Jamie Turner, who is in lovely and I'm sure kind of hot Atlanta today. Hey, John. Great to be here. Glad to, glad to see you. And it's also, yeah, it is, a, as always, a little bit muggy right now in Atlanta. Yeah. Well, I'm down here in San Diego, and we're actually getting a bit of, we have heat advisory warnings now. I mean, normally it's nice here. I mean, it's hot, it's nice, but it's actually really, really hot today. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, crazy, That which is unusual for San Diego, yeah, I know. Yeah. All right. Well, Jamie's the author of three books, How to Make Money with Social Media, Go Mobile, and the latest book, Digital Marketing Growth Hacks. So I wanted to talk about the third book. And uh, we always hear about hacks. And so digital marketing growth hacks sounds really interesting. So when you when you talk about growth hacks, what are you talking about, Jamie? You know, more and more people are trying to find new ways to reach prospects and convert them to customers. And what has happened over the last 10 years, really, is uh, the population is resisting advertising and traditional marketing methods. So they're they're pushing back. If you think about ad blockers or on a lot of people's smartphones, uh, people fast forward through TV commercials. So there's a real challenge to break through that clutter and figure out ways to to get in front of prospects and convert them into customers. So what we did was we said, well, there's these there are these hacks that you can do. Some of them pretty well known already. Other ones innovative, different, unusual, where you can do these things in order to get people to uh, click through on your emails or click through on your banner ads or do whatever on digital marketing as a way to get them to engage with your brand and ultimately buy your product. Yeah, it's it's interesting that you say that because I have been observing over the last while of it, it's just how savvy people are becoming in terms of of getting away from advertising, right? I mean, we have whole generations growing up now who watch everything on streaming media and they almost don't even know what an advert, you know, what a commercial is, right? And uh, and, and people have have taken that online, etc. So how do you, so to your point, like how do you break through that real kind of active defense mechanism people have it's a it's difficult but there is a way to do it it's something i call nonlinear marketing and nonlinear marketing is actually going in and weaving the fabric of your brand into the consumer's life so what do i mean by that instead of interrupting the consumer with a 30 second tv commercial or a 30 second video or whatever what you're doing is trying to become part of the consumer's life so that it's almost a seamless experience so that they're participating in the brand's life and the brand is participating in the consumer's life. And the result is, is that it almost doesn't feel like advertising or marketing. So when you, uh, when you Starbucks famously did a series of small little series of documentary films about good people in various markets, their whole goal was Let's engage you, get you to participate with us on YouTube. We're not going to sell you anything. We're just going to become part of your life so that you'll forward this to friends, so that you'll remember Starbucks and all that sort of stuff. And that's that's what I call nonlinear marketing. Traditional marketing was linear. It was very sort of in your face. Yeah. Nonlinear marketing is where, again, the brand weaves itself into the fabric of the consumer's life. So if you're if you're a, a, a marketing person or a salesperson or a company watching this right now and you're a smaller company and you say, well, yeah, Starbucks, that's great. You know, they have unlimited, well, they used to have unlimited budget. I'm not sure about today. Um, how does a, a smaller company do this kind of nonlinear marketing when they don't have access to massive budgets? Actually, it works great for smaller companies. One of the ways to think about it is, Nonlinear marketing is more experiential in nature, and linear marketing is more passive. So nonlinear marketing is designed to uh, sweep people up and get them engaged with your brand. So as an example, if you are a smaller brand, then you can start doing a series of events around town. That's a real simple execution. On another side of the equation, and again, I'm going to give an example of a yep. big brand that did this, but this doesn't mean you can't adapt this kind of thing. In the old days, Swatch, this is a real thing that happened, Swatch would have done a big billboard on top of a building, as an example, and there's a building in Germany where I've got a picture of it. Instead of doing that, Swatch said, let's skip the billboard. What we're going to do is on the side of the building, put an actual Swatch, and it's <laughs> going to take up 20 floors of the building. So what ends up happening is people walk by, they see it, they engage with it because it's a new and novel thing. They also look at the time on it. They also talk about it when they're at their uh, office around the water cooler saying, by the way, did you see that big, huge thing? So even though that's an example of something that might have been expensive, 
you can take those ideas and distill them down and just do things that are innovative, interesting, and different. And ultimately what ends up happening is the combination of the innovation and the difference is what matters. It's not the amount of money you spend, it's the amount of breakthrough ideas you have. Let me throw one idea yeah. to people here right now. A piece of chalk and a sidewalk is a great way to send messages to people, but make sure the messages aren't sales messages. Mm -hmm. Maybe the messages all the way down a street or all in a neighborhood are positive, uplifting messages, and it's just signed Bob's Widgets or Sally's <laughs> Coffee Shop or whatever it is, and all you're doing is trying to do something that makes you part of the consumer's life as opposed to interrupting it. You're actually participating, and that's the big idea behind nonlinear marketing. Yeah, that's a, that's a great example. The, the Swatch one's a great example because, um, like you said, has anyone ever come home and said, did you see the billboard on Route 65 today? Wow, wasn't that fantastic? You got to go drive by and take a look at it, right? Nobody's, nobody has said no one ever. Um, but as you say, you come home and say, wow, did you see the big Swatch on the side of the building? That's really cool. And I like your taking it really down to, to, to grassroots, the idea of doing chalk on a sidewalk. Well, you know, positive messages. Who doesn't like that? So I guess the idea of what you're saying here is, um, is, is that way of connecting with people as opposed to shouting at them. Yeah, that's a great way to think of it. I'm going to steal that totally okay. from now. I'm going to say marketing, uh, nonlinear marketing is about connecting with people instead of shouting at people. That's a great way to describe it. And when you have a relationship, of course, with, with your consumer, or your prospects, again, it's a deeper, more meaningful relationship. And particularly in today's environment, people are looking for authenticity. They're not looking for salesmanship. So the idea of let me sell you something. Let me be loud about this. Let me tell you why you got to buy, 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 buy. They don't like that. What they do like is just this authentic participatory uh, in, environment where they can become part of your brand. You can become part of their life. And that really seems to be working for a lot of brands, whether it's big brands or small brands. Mm -hmm. So what are some other examples that you have seen of, of people being innovative? Because I think people would be really fascinated by these examples because they don't necessarily jump out at you to do things. People get very constrained and sort of stick to what they know, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, a couple of them. Red Bull has done a good job. Red Bull traditionally hasn't done much advertising. They do a little bit now. But more of what Red Bull has done, and by the way, they've been doing it for a long time. Mm -hmm. Nobody's called it nonlinear marketing, but nonlinear marketing has actually been kind of percolating up for quite some time. What Red Bull did was they said, you know what, we're going to skip the traditional marketing stuff. We're going to do events. We're going to sponsor a sports team. We're going to do music. We're going to do, we're going to actually publish music. We're going to do all of these different things. But it's not just that they're slapping their logo on an event. If you think about the Red Bull air races, yeah. the whole idea behind that is not, hey, we just slapped our logo on the side of this air race that was an existing thing. No, 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 no. Red Bull sat back and said, what is adrenaline inducing, hey, how about an air race? The other one was, hey, what can we kind of own that nobody else is doing right now? Oh, an air race, okay. And the third was, hey, what, what can we do where, where when people are watching it, they're imagining our target market would be imagining themselves doing exactly that. And if you've ever seen those air races, yeah. You are inside that cockpit and really doing the air race while you're watching it. So it was much more than just slapping a logo on something or sponsoring a, a baseball team, which a lot of people do. Mm -hmm. It was, no, 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 let's build this around, event around our consumer and around the aspirational goals of our consumer, which is, I want to live that life. Even if I can't actually live it, I want to live it temporarily while I'm watching the Red Bull Air Race so that I can participate in it. And for the 30 minutes I'm watching it, be that guy or that woman in the cockpit racing around on the air races. So it was a whole big thing around it, not just hey, let's slap our logo on the side of an airplane. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, Red Bull have definitely been one of the leaders in, in showing how to do this. Because then, let's face it, when you pick up a, a, a can of Red Bull and drink it, you kind of imagine that it's it's pumping some of that adrenaline and specialness into you to be able to do stuff. Even if, it's, even if you know it's really not, you kind of buy into it, right? Yeah, absolutely. And it can really go on from there. Um, I'm going to spill the beans. I, I had an idea about two years ago that wasn't picked up by a client. So I'm passing this along to your listeners if anybody wants to steal this idea. It was for uh, a, a, uh, a Western steakhouse 
Um, and they basically had na nationwide uh, mm -hmm. uh, steakhouses. And I thought, all right, this has kind of a country flair to it, but a, a Western country, Southern flair to it. What can we do that would be really cool that would play off of that? And I said, why don't we get a, 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 a tour bus and get a band, a country music band, an up and coming country music person to go around the country and they go around the country and do this tour around the country and do these pop up concerts in the parking lots of these base uh these restaurants mm -hmm. all around the country and then people start following it and tuning in and there's surprise events all of a sudden they pop up all of a sudden you get a crowd there all of a sudden that's uploaded to youtube and people start following this whole mm -hmm. thing around it was a neat idea and the cost of that wouldn't be all that much especially right. if, if you have a up-and-coming country sure. music star who's dying to get yeah. the exposure yeah so that yes. was an idea. They didn't take it, so it's out there now and eat that for anybody to use. <laughs> <laughs> so if anybody has a chain of restaurants or a chain of anything, and um, hey, there you go. Yeah. Make sure absolutely. you send a make sure you send a few uh, a few percentage points over to Jamie. Though. <laughs> 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 Always happy to do that. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so do you think uh, today? Um, how do you think marketing people can break out of some of the constrained linear thinking of the past? Because you know, let's face it, a lot of a lot of people, as I said, are trapped in old styles of thinking, or or they think, oh well, it's all very well for Red Bull, but you already said, look, get your chalk out and chalk your pavement, and you could do it. How do you help yeah. people break out of this? Because it's such a comfort zone to just do the old style you know check i mean and it's funny even to call it old style because it's not even that old but, yeah but the uh, the 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 things that people have been doing that are tuning out customers that, that's a great question um it's hard because what happens for all of us is we sit around and we go man i'm just barely getting through the week you know now uh you know jamie and john are talking about going to the next level and i'm just happy that we got everything done without a major mistake or you know something blowing up in our face. So I get that, I totally get that. So the goal is, is to set up a series of meetings where you have a team that gets in place and starts brainstorming these ideas. No pressure, probably something that you do on a Friday afternoon, you might even pop a few beers open or whatever, just to set the tone of relaxation. And then you just start going around and saying, guys, we're gonna just come up with 50 different ideas that might work. Now, out of 50 ideas, 45 of them are going to be horrible, but that's okay because <laughs> you got five that might work. And if you just make that a regular Friday afternoon meeting where you get the team together and start doing that, things will crop up and things will percolate to the surface. And then all of a sudden, you can even do a game where you reward somebody with the most interesting case study on how this kind of stuff works. Let me give you a great example. Airbnb, when they were small, they were a tiny little company. They were not, they didn't have a budget. They were doing the same thing we're all talking about. How do we do this on no budget? Well, they went and said, how do we get uh, uh, the people around the country to know about our stuff? Here's what they did, it was fascinating. This is a perfect example. They went in and they said, we don't have an advertising budget, but what we do have is somebody who's pretty good with computers. And they know, they've figured out a way to go into Craigslist, and when somebody types in, places to stay in Denver or wherever it was, mm -hmm. or Seattle, doesn't matter, that they, they would then have the, their computer system write an ad in that Craigslist that followed right after that search. So what ended up happening is somebody would go in on Monday and they'd go, oh, I got to go to Denver in a few weeks and I better kind of check this thing out. They do and they do the search. Then Airbnb would come in an hour later and have this automated software that would say, hey, here's some places to stay at Airbnb in Denver. It would write the Craigslist ad. Then the next day when the person goes back to continue to search, they go, oh, that ad wasn't here yesterday. Let me do that. Now, that's a perfect example yeah. of a growth hack, a way to find your way into the consumer's life without sitting around and trying to do traditional advertising. Now, all that required was innovation and some expertise. Admittedly, they had people who knew uh, uh, computer software language and stuff like that that they could get in on the backside. But it was it was available, ready, readily available to anybody who came up with that idea. It just happens to be that Airbnb saw that opportunity first and ran with it. Yeah, and and I love that. Uh, I love that uh, suggestion that you had about getting together and brainstorming because I think today, if you take an average organization, we don't know. I mean, everybody's doing all this other stuff when they're not at work, and uh, you know, everybody has all these different experiences, and we probably don't do a good job of actually tapping into all the things that people can do. 
we don't know, maybe there's somebody in your organization who in their personal life is an absolute Instagram whiz, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, corporately, you're kind of struggling. You're like, mm, yeah, I guess we should be on Instagram, but I don't know what to say. And maybe you, you can tap into that. But I like that idea of like bringing the brain trust together and kind of taking the shackles off and saying, okay, let's come up with no idea is a bad idea, right? Yeah, yeah. And I think the key thing is be innovative. Uh, people forget stuff digitally, by the way, tomorrow. So if you're a little nervous about do, trotting something out that might <laughs> blow up in your face, just trot it out there. Tomorrow, nobody's going to remember it anyway. <laughs> but just consistently do that. And I think over the course of time, you'll find yourself doing it. But what you'd need to have is permission to do that. A uh, great case study of uh, uh, computer geeks, the co the company that used to send the guys around uh, fixing computers, right. and they interviewed the guy. Became a billion dollar company, and he sold it and all that sort of stuff. They said, you know, that was really quirky and different. You had these guys in these white shirts that looked like geeks, and they drove around in those funny cars, and your logo was very, very different. He said, tell you what, if I had worked at a large corporation, that never would have happened, and right. that's what separated us was that we took a risk because we were small. It was a bunch of people sitting around a table. And we said, we can do this. We can do this. We can do this. They did it. But he said, if at, a, at any corporation, we would have been shot down because it would have been, quote unquote, too risky. So the bottom line is take risks. It's like the stock market. The bigger the risk, the bigger the return. Yes, you also run the risk of a big failure, but that's okay because if you do it over the course of time, eventually you're going to find the winners. And then you just repeat, rinse and repeat on the winners and keep doing those over and over and over again. And you're off to the races. Yeah. And, and, I, and I love that piece of advice about the fact that, let's face it, for most organizations, the failures are not going to be catastrophic and they're going to be forgotten very quickly, right? Absolutely. Thank God for me, because I've failed way more times than I've succeeded. So mostly people forget about all the failures, although I keep reminding them of them all the time. <laughs> so that so uh, that other piece of advice is, yeah, get together, brainstorm, be innovative. But also as an organization, you have to be prepared to let people experiment and let people fail uh, and fail their way to success. Right. Actually, Amazon, from what I understand, part of the growth behind Amazon, other than a lot of brilliant people over there, is that they have a uh, a culture of saying yes. Most corporate cultures are those of saying no. Mm -hmm. People are looking for reasons not to do something. And so all of us could sit in any meeting and find a reason not to invent a car. You know, well, it's got four wheels. What if the, one of the tires blows up and it kills somebody, will get sued, all that sort of stuff. But at Amazon, from what I understand, it's a culture of yes. They just say yes to something until until there's really, really, really a, a, an absolutely bulletproof reason not to do it. But the culture is to say yes. And that's what you need when you're coming up with some of these non- linear marketing ideas. Excellent. A fantastic way to round out this interview. Jamie Turner, this has been really fascinating. And I think there's a lot of great takeaways for people who watch this. Uh, before you go, just tell everybody a little bit more about yourself, how they can learn more about you. Yeah, absolutely. Three places to find out about me. One is 60 Second Marketer. That's my blog. It's six zero and the word second and the word marketer.com. Uh, another is jamieturner.live. I speak around the globe teaching people all over the place exactly what we just talked about here. And the third way to reach me is just Google Jamie Turner, J-A-M-I-E Turner. And I'll come up on the first page of Google and you can just click through on any of those links and it'll take you to one of my websites. Great. Listen, Jamie, it's been uh, fantastic. I've really enjoyed it. I've taken some ideas away myself here, and uh, um, I'm and I may be getting a bus and a country and western band after this. <laughs> <laughs> you and me both. <laughs> All right, John Golden, online uh, uh, sales pop, uh, online sales magazine, pipeline of CRM. We'll see you all again soon. Bye. So I encourage you to subscribe to salespop.net, the online sales magazine. Also subscribe to our YouTube channel and then comment. Get involved in the conversation. Love to hear what you have to say.